let's take out our Bibles and learn together. When you hear good news, how do you respond? Well, you should respond with joy, with gladness, and an excitement, and a passion wanting to respond to that good news in faith. The problem is this. Many times, instead of believing, what do we do? We doubt. Now, remember what the scripture says. One who doubts ought not to expect anything from God. God moves in a person's life, in their circumstances, in their situations, when they believe. Not just believe what they want, but to believe God's revelation. Now, think of where we are in our study. A few weeks ago, we began our study of Luke's Gospel. And soon thereafter, early on in that first chapter, we move to the account of a priestly family. A priest, that word priest in Hebrew, Kohen, simply means a servant. Someone who has a call upon their life to specifically serve God. Now, God was important to this family. We see this, that is because they submitted to the authority of God's Word. And they did so in a very good manner. The scripture says both Zachariah and his wife Elizabeth, they were blameless before God, sensitive to do all the corrections, all the, the errors that they made to bring about a repair, to seek atonement, to seek God's forgiveness. They were committed, but notice something. Now, Zachariah, according to the lot that fell upon him, he went into the holy place, to that altar of incense, that related to, and we talked about this, that offering up of the offering of incense corresponded with the time that the people were praying. They were making their requests, their supplications known to God. And Zachariah had a request, one that he had prayed for for a long time, and that is that he would have a son. So much time had expired. So many years had elapsed, and it seems as though God was silent. And then, in the midst of his service, what happens? The angel of the Lord appears to him. And the angel says, God has heard your prayer. You're going to have a son. Now, he should have been so excited. He was told that this boy is going to be unique. He is going to go before him, meaning going before Messiah. He is going to have a dramatic change upon the people. He is going to serve in the spirit and in the power of Elijah, that great man of God. I mean, what great news. And he should have just said, yes, Lord, thank you. I am so grateful that God has heard my prayer and is responding to it. But notice what he said. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Luke chapter 1. And we're ready for now, verse 18. This is John's, this is Zachariah's response to the angel, verse 18. And Zechariah said to the angel, According to what will I know this? Now, that is a doubt. He's saying, I want proof. Well, wait a second. An angel of the Lord, in fact, the angel of the Lord, is standing before him. He had never witnessed this. This has never happened before. This special angel of the Lord. And he says here in a faithless response, According to what will I know this? For I am old, he uses the term an elder, I am an elderly man, and my wife is well advanced in her days. Meaning, she's not of the time to give birth. What is he doing? Finding excuses. This is how 
most humans are. God says, I want to do something in your life. And we want proof. We want it to be made. We want to be understanding what God's going to do. Well, we can't. Why? So many of the things that God does, it's supernatural. It goes beyond our human capacity to understand. We're supposed to receive it in faith, knowing that a supernatural, miraculous God, all things are possible with Him. But what does Zechariah do? He wants proof. He doubts. And he starts giving the reasons why this can't be. I'm an old man. My wife is is advanced, well advanced in years. She's saying, this is not going to happen. Well, notice the response. Verse 19. The angel, this angel of the Lord, the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel. Now, this term, Gabriel, means the mighty God. It speaks about the God who is strong, the God who is without limitations. God is strong enough for any obstacle. Nothing is difficult with God. And he says, look again, I am Gabriel, the one who has stood, is standing, and will stand. That's the grammatical tense of this Greek word. The one who is standing before God. He means, I have a history with God. I have stood before him, meaning I've witnessed things in the past. I'm standing before him now and I will continue. He's saying, I know this eternal God and God's able to do that. He is a mighty God. Keep reading. More than that, he says, and I have been sent to speak to you. And, and we have the word for gospel, to proclaim these glad tidings unto you. He says, God, the one who I stand before, meaning I'm under the authority of God. I I don't speak on my own initiative. I only have said to you what God has told me to tell you. And it is good news. It relates to the gospel. That is God's plan of redemption. And that plan of redemption involves, and hear this, whenever that word redemption is mentioned, one of the aspects of it is restoration. Restoration means putting things back in the original way, either in that original way or even an improved way. God is going to restore us to himself. That relationship that that Adam and Eve had in the garden before that fall, that sin of of partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God's going to restore that back to something even better. This is God. God, when he restores that restoration, puts us even into a better situation than was previously in the original. This is the nature of God. He likes to give a double blessing. So all of this is what Gabriel is telling uh, this man, Zachariah, not to be faithless, but to believe. And notice something else. Keep reading. He says in verse 20, And behold, you shall be silent. Now, God is going to do something. God is going to show Zachariah his power. Now, almost all of his life, he's been able to speak. Since the time that he was a a toddler, he was able to, to enunciate words. But things are going to change. Why? He is going to have a new experience. This one who was able to speak, he is going to be silent. Notice what the scripture says, verse 20. And behold, whenever that term's there, behold, Pay attention, something significant is going to happen. He says, and behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until which day that these things are fulfilled. He says, you are going to be silent, unable to speak until these things are fulfilled. He's going to show 
God's authority, God's power. Meaning this, God is in control. Now, that is a foundational principle that we need to realize, that we need to submit to, that we need to live under the authority of the fact that God is in control. Does that mean that everything that happens in this world is, is God's will? It does not. We're going to talk about, in another message, the sovereignty of God. And we're going to see that God is sovereign, but that does not mean that everything that happens in this world is God's will. There is sin. Sin is never God's will. But the point is this. Ultimately, God will bring everything into His will. For those who are redeemed, what is His will? Eternal blessing. For those who reject the redemption of God, they are going to receive that eternal curse. So you are either going to be blessed eternally or cursed eternally. And, and you determine what it's, what it's going to be. When you seek God's redemption, and understand this, there's only one means of redemption, and that is that gospel message that focuses in on the death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah as a free gift. It is not by our works that we're justified, but it's by faith, believing what God has provided. This is what Luke is going to teach us. But look again at our text. It says here, these things are going to be fulfilled in their time, but he says, middle of verse 20, but because which you did not believe my word. Now that's literally what he says, because of the fact that you did not believe my words, it says, this is going to be filled, these things are going to be filled in their time. But in the midst of that, until they are, you're going to be silent and unable to speak. Verse 21. Now, remember the context where we left off. This angel of the Lord appeared to Zachariah when he was doing this assignment that fell to him by Lot. Lot usually relates to the will of God. It was God's will, that's why the lot fell upon Zachariah, to go into the holy place, to be the one offering up this incense offering when Gabriel, this angel of the Lord, appeared to him. And they're having this conversation as the incense offering has gone up and by this time, it's long been completed. It's not a long process. Therefore, notice the, the context. Look now to verse 21. It says, And the people were expecting Zacharias, and they marveled at the time he was spending in the sanctuary, that he had been there for so long. And then verse 22 but having come out, he was not able to speak to them. And they recognize, what did they recognize? That a vision he saw. Now, again, what's so interesting about the original language is that there's a consistency here in this text. When we speak about something that has to do with the purpose of God, the plans of God, it's usually in the tense that speaks about something in the past, having a present reality, but also a future fulfillment. Why is that? Well, what does it say that, that they knew that he had saw? A vision. And this vision began in the past, meaning it had a relevance to prophetic promises. These profe prophetic promises were still enforced at that time but they were going to have their fulfillment in the future so this vision had a connection to the past it's going on now but ultimately it's going to have its full fulfillment in the past that's what it means when it says he saw a vision he saw that vision with such implications past 
present, and future. And then it says, keep reading, verse 22 in the middle. And he was making signs to them, and he continued being a mute. Now, again, the Word of God is so wonderful because when it says he was making signs that he couldn't speak, he became a mute, and it says he continued to be a mute, that is, unable to speak. But this word for continuing is in a Greek grammatical construction known as the imperfect, and whenever the imperfect appears, we should expect a change, meaning this. The imperfect is used to say what is happening now is not going to continue for an indefinite period of time. We should expect a change, and John is going to be able, excuse me, Zachar, Zachariah is going to be able to speak in the future. So that's why it says that he remained as a mute. Verse 23, and it came about when the days of his service were fulfilled that he went away into his house. And then notice this, but after these days, just as the angel had proclaimed, but after these days, Elizabeth, his wife, conceived. But notice what she did. But she hid herself for five months. Now, everything in the scripture is important. Notice what's being said. God's faithful. He is working this out according to the exact revelation that the angel Gabriel said. He is now mute, unable to speak. Why? Because he doubted the message. Secondly, he completed that assignment. People saw that there was a vision that he had seen, that something had happened, that he was unable to speak. He could only make signs. And he went home and after completing all of this service, when he was at home, God was faithful. His wife, Elizabeth, and remember, we're told two times, she is an old woman. The scripture says, she is well advanced in days. That is a reference to tell us that her fertility has long ceased. She was barren, but in her early years, when she could produce a child by age, she couldn't. But now, that time of fertility had long expired. But what happened? Miraculously, God did something. God took that womb that was dead, infertile, and he made it fertile. He put life into that which was dead. Don't miss the, the imagery here. Don't miss why God does things in the way that he does. He is going to create life out of nothing. This is what God can do. So look once more at the text. We read in verse 24. But after these things, the, the, the days of these things, Elizabeth, his wife, conceived. And she hid herself for five months. Why five? Five is the number of, of incompletion. She waited until that sixth month, the fifth month, shows lacking. And when she went past that, when it was obvious that she was pregnant, that she was showing, that it was sure that this word was, was fulfilled in her life, it says that the end of five months, notice what is revealed. This is what happened. She was saying that thus the Lord has done unto me in these days. What has he done? He has looked, and this is an important term. He has looked. Why is that so important? Well, remember something. We're talking about redemption. God's plan to, to bless, and not just bless one family, but that all the families of the earth potentially could be blessed. And it says, and she speaks, that God has looked. God has saw something. Why is that so important? Because if you look, 
in a very key passage. In fact, this is a passage that is read every day. I want to say it again. Every morning in the synagogue, we read about the binding of Isaac. And do you remember what it says there? That God looked and he provided. He provided that which was necessary so that Isaac would live. Instead of being sacrificed, he provided that, that ram that was caught in the thicket by his horns. And when Elizabeth says, God looked, and what did God do? He saw something lacking. He saw something that was disturbing. And God looked and he responded. And what did he do? Well, keep reading where it says, and he took away my reproach among people. Meaning this, here is Elizabeth, this godly woman, sensitive to the things of God, walking her and her husband blamelessly in the, the instructions and the ordinances of God. They were faithful people, committed to, and when it says the commandments and the ordinances, it's talking about the Torah. The Torah was important to them, meaning this. God's instruction for righteousness is what they wanted to base their life upon. And they did so blamelessly. And I want to say again because I get emails in regard to this. People don't understand what the scripture means, means when it says blamelessly. It doesn't mean that they were without sin. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. The scripture says no one is righteous, no, not one. There's only one exception to that, and that is Messiah Yeshua. The scripture says even though he was tempted at all points like all human beings, he never sinned. Being tempted is not a sin. Acting on that temptation is sin, and Messiah never did. He is the perfect eternal son of God. He never sinned sinned so when it says that they walked in the commandments and the ordinances of God righteously doesn't mean that that Zachariah and Elizabeth were without sin it means that when they did sin they utilized the Torah for finding forgiveness making that atonement wanting to find once more God's favor through that sacrificial system which was and means to, to, to secure forgiveness. That's what it means when it says blamelessly. They utilize scripture for their spiritual condition. And now what do we have? We have this couple that loved God so, that were committed to God, that walked in his ways, but there was something missing in their life. They had no child. And what would people be saying? Well, what people always do. You know, if you're not being blessed, there must be a problem with you. There, there must be something that you're doing. And the scripture says that, that when she was, was impregnated, when her husband placed seed within her and she conceived a son, what did that do? Well, the scripture says that God looked upon me and he took away the reproach, my reproach, among men. Meaning the shame, the disgrace that I felt, God removed it. And this is what redemption does. It removes all those things in order that the glory of God and the presence of God can be seen within us. This is what he's talking about here. This is what God does. God wants to restore you back to a right relationship where his glory can be manifested through you. God has the means to do that. Nothing's difficult for God. All we have to do is to receive it. That was the problem with Zachariah. He wasn't believing this, this miraculous God, this God that can do all things. Don't doubt God. Accept his word. Realize that his word contains the truth 
so that we can find God's will being realized in our life. But here's the question. Do you really want God's will? Is this what you are praying for? See, Zachariah and Elizabeth, they were interested in the things of God. They were praying for the things of God. And when the people were at that time of the incense offering, making their requests and petitions for God, what's foundational? God, would you do that work of restoration? Would, would you do and bring redemption to us? And God began that process with who? With the birth of Yochanan, Hamatbil, meaning John the Baptist, that he was going to go before Yeshua. And we're going to see next week, as we continue on in this same section of chapter 1, there's going to be the focus upon God's faithfulness concerning Messiah. That we're going to see this relationship through this family of a miraculous birth, a miraculous conception. God does the miraculous in order to bring about His purposes. So let me ask you a question. Do you believe in a miraculous God? A God who is, is intimately aware of your life, your hurt, your pain, your problems, what you struggle with, the sin in your life, and God is offering you an opportunity. God loves you perfectly. He's demonstrated that love, and He is willing to bring about restoration, to remove, just like he did that, that shame, that disgrace, that contempt that Elizabeth was feeling, he can remove that from you. But there's only one way, and that one way is through the Son of God, Messiah Yeshua. Without him, there is no hope. I want to close with that. Realize this important truth. Without you having faith in Messiah, accepting his work, what he did, in order to for you to be forgiven you don't have hope but if you receive him you'll have hope and you'll have blessings and you will be a recipient of his promises where in his kingdom